Uh, thank you again, uh, Lisa, and the entire organization for bringing me in. Um, so today, I want to share a bit of what um, we have been doing along the journey, 10 years in the making, actually a bit more. Uh, that was the first Hyatt we worked with that brought us with the success we faced, that brought us to the corporate office to present our solution. Then we worked with eight Hyatts in five countries in Asia Pacific. And after the successful rollouts, we are now working with 55, uh, 60 Hyatts actually in Asia Pacific. And hopefully it is just the beginning. So this is, this is we, have gone, we have gone a long way. I'll skip the, uh, the, the, uh, you know, the advertisement. The purpose of that uh, specific uh, slide is to show that we're not only working with hotels, which is kind of our historical, uh, um, I would say, partners, but we also work with restaurants. And I saw some of your questions, which I hope I will be able to address. And higher education, this is just fundamental and something I'm extremely excited about because we capture so much material since we started to work on this topic that it is essential that this knowledge is instilled or shared with the next generation, those that will hit the kitchens in two years' time. We don't have enough time to wait for the kindergarten kids, you know, to be aware of it. It's starting there. I have some kids, they started to be aware of that. But, I mean, we don't have time. So, we need to work on those that will hit the industry very soon and that will be in decision-making uh, position very soon so they can take the right decision. And so we also work well a lot with those guys and then development agencies, uh, uh, etc. Anyway, let's go back to the topic. This is the food waste pyramid. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. This is the approach that should be followed in order to um, basically look at food waste from the most impactful to the less impactful uh, uh, option. So typically, we are clearly focusing on this. The preventive side, you know, the best waste is the waste you don't create, right? So this is, this is literally where we are focusing. Then there are several options when you follow the food waste pyramid, which is feed people, as Stefan mentioned, feed animal, especially animal that would enter the food supply chain for humans, and then transform. Transformation can take several, several um, uh, shape or forms can be what, uh, what Stefan presented already, can be composting system, can be waste to energy, can be insect farms, which is a big thing that is coming. I don't know if you're aware, but this is coming, and I think as future of protein is gonna, take, uh, is gonna play a big role. Um, but the objective is this one. And what we're trying to do now is to get the industry to start thinking in those terms. It should not be acceptable in 2023 to run operations that are mingling waste, organic waste, with non-organic waste and just dumping it all to the landfill. I mean, this is so outdated. So it is time to push for this, uh, uh, that agenda because just to give a, a tiny perspective, why is it bad to send food waste to the landfill? Because usually it's not disposed properly. Either it is burned, then it requires even more energy to burn waste because it is soaked, it is wet, or it starts to rot, and when it rots, it creates methane. And methane is an extremely potent greenhouse gas that is 25 to 30, 30 times more potent than actually carbon dioxide. And that's a killer. And you may have seen very close from here in Bali, uh, uh, recent fires happening on the landfill. That's also because of that. The Metropolitan Authority are estimating that about 50% of all waste on the landfill are organic waste. So it's a, it's a time bomb that is ticking just over there. So I think it's time to push for zero food waste to landfill uh, operation. And we are trying to, um, you know, to contribute uh, a way or, or, or another. This way. Here we go. So there are a couple of things. For us, in order to address such a complex issue that is food waste, there is no magic bullet. There is no, you know, you plug and play, that's done. There are several components that must be taken into account. Stefan mentioned it, I think leadership is essential. If you don't have the right leadership and the right vision, which is this is how we're gonna do for now, it cannot, it cannot go anywhere. But to drive and to assess the success of the implementation of your strategy, you need to monitor. 
So you need to capture information. The information we're trying to capture with the technology we developed is basically very simple. How much, when, where, what, and why is food wasted? So those five information helps to build a matrix of, of information around your food waste and your situation. So then you can understand and answer those questions. Where are your weaknesses, where are your strengths, and where you should put your efforts on? So the question that was asked earlier, this is also a technology that is used in smaller, smaller uh, uh, operation like restaurants. Very simple in a nutshell. The bet we made was like, we're not going to build a machine. There's a lot of people uh, that are actually providing machines. We decided that we want to use existing devices, like all the one you have in your hands, can work as a data entry point. That is to me essential, so we don't have to, you know, to dig in the earth, new material, manufacture, transport, and then when it breaks, that it doesn't work. So this is all generic, and I think that's a nice twist uh, uh, for this. And the idea is that you download the app, you enter the data, the information goes to the cloud, and you start receiving performance report. And those performance report will tell you again how well you're doing compared to your starting point, usually seven days of operation. Are you increasing or decreasing your food waste per cover, which is one of the key metrics we're following, by how much, how many percent? And then we dive a bit further into, so this is day-to-day -day performance compared to the starting point. But then we look as well as food waste per cover per shift. As well, how well is your breakfast, your, your lunch, and your dinner doing comparing to your initial baseline and the variation in percentage? And we do the same for the, what we call categories of food waste, spoilage, preparation, buffet, and plate waste, always in gram per cover, which is used as a baseline and then moving forward to compare it. So that's, that's in a nutshell how data is helping to guide the decision-making process for kitchen, uh, uh, kitchen leaders. And the idea with a non, I would say, generic base is that you can cover multiple operations and multiple larger sites, which is essential because Forgot to share, but there was this, this, uh, this uh, anecdote, and it keeps on running. You know, I'm speaking with, with very high up executive in the hospitality sector, talking about food waste. And the first thing they always say is, ah, yeah, the buffet is generating a lot of food waste. But actually, it's not true. The buffet is technically, yes, but it's a visible part. Once you start scanning the hotel as if it was, you know, a big a big living organism, and you start taking different recording points where food is either stored, prepared, served, or disposed of, then you realize that buffet waste for a hotel will represent only 10 to 15%. Half of it in volume is usually happening behind closed doors, spoilage and preparation. So that's just to, to share some of the, uh, some of the, uh, uh, the findings. Um, that's on the data collection, that's really, the, I would say the backbone of, of um, tangible information that you capture on an ongoing basis, and that's essential, is not just a spot check on your operation. It runs as part of the way you run your kitchen, and that's why we want to work with the culinary uh, schools, is to embed that in the way you run a restaurant. You, it shouldn't be conceivable that you run a restaurant without monitoring your food waste at the end of the shift. At least that's, that's how I conceive it. And then the pledge on food waste. So the pledge on food waste was actually, um, it came to life after already, we started in 2012, so around 2017, 2018, um, where we decided to put together all the best practices we had identified to help minimize food waste, save on cost, and basically uh, uh, stand out from the crowd. So 95 criteria, that are articulated into seven pillars that are third-party verified. So you follow the structure, you implement change from the back of house, from the training of your team, from the way you engage with diners, from how do you handle your food leftovers at the end of the shift once you have minimized as much as possible for redistribution, for transformation, for animal feed, or transformation uh, into something valuable. And down the line, you're being audited. So the auditor will define either you fail or you pass. And if you pass, then you have different levels. And those levels uh, will help also to benchmark the level of performance of your kitchen compared to your competitors or to your sister properties if you belong to a larger group. 
So the idea is to encapsulate best practices, to have it third party verified, so this can be used as a way to show that your operations are actually performing to the highest possible standard. This is some example in, uh, uh, around the industry. We started recently, uh, we happened to be in the US, unfortunately, with the wrong uh, TV channel, uh, but still, it was nice. Shh, don't say. I didn't say anything. Now let's talk money, because obviously, well, that was the first thing, as I mentioned, that, that I faced as a, as a pushback is, oh yeah, you call, you do food waste, and oh well, I don't have time. I was like, <laughs> okay, let's talk, let's talk. How many kilos you're wasting? Where is it happening? What is it? How often? How much does that represent on a daily basis? Now put that in a dollar figure, and tell me that this is not an important topic for you. So. I will try to play that video. I don't know if it's go through. It's one minute, not, not hours, but I think it's brilliant. So I don't know if, uh, if we can watch it. Apparently not. Ah, uh, yes, we can. No? I will skip that. I will, it's OK. I will, I will, uh, I will cover it. Uh, I'll cover this, the, 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 the next one. OK, well, I will send you the link. This is brilliant. Uh, video where they are using basically uh, coins and, and money that they are cutting to get the team to understand that food waste equal money waste. Everybody know what this 18% uh, stands for? No. Okay. Is the inflation rate on food over 2022 for the FNB sector. So as if food waste was not important enough, like from, you know, I'm, 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 I'm not even talking about the environmental or the social absurdity of food waste. Talking financially speaking, boom, suddenly what you used to buy is 20% more expensive. So you have to be extra cautious now about what ends up in the bin if you don't want to be bankrupt, uh, basically, especially if, uh, if your margin are a bit tight. So food waste has several, I would say, components. You have the direct cost, cost of the ingredient that you purchase, cost of disposal, and then you have all the hidden costs. Manpower, wear and tears, utility, water and energy, and societal costs, which for many <clears throat> is not even worth uh, uh, their time. But that's important to keep in mind. It's not just what you purchase and is lost. All the effort put, I'm not even talking before the food arrive at the back door, right? But even within your organization, for this to end up here, eh, it's, a bit, it's a bit sad and doesn't really make much sense. So that's, that's important uh, um, to start and for us to start from the right foot and to understand what is the cost of food waste and how are we calculating the cost of food waste. Bear with me. <laughs> It's a bit technical, but for those of you that really want to get to the cheese of it and to the bottom of it, uh, uh, I will explain in details. The way we calculate the cost of food waste is based on the system I presented earlier, the FIT technology, where we have spoilage, preparation, buffet, and plate waste, to which we will use the data that we collect over the baseline period. The baseline period is your reference point before you start implementing change. And this baseline period, usually seven days, we collect all the data from, uh, uh, from the kitchens. And <clears throat> typically here, over the seven days, there was only one kilo of spoilage that was recorded. Then preparation waste, there was 3.2 tons that were actually wasted, but we reduced by 50% because of the offcuts, because of the non-edible part of the food, all the things that end up naturally when you cut and prepare your food. So we decide on purpose to remove 50%. Then buffet waste, in that case, there was 257 kilos of buffet waste that was recorded in seven days. And then plate waste, same principle, but we reduce by 20% the way, considering that from what we've seen, whatever ends up in that big bin that is the plate waste, 20% is actually non-edible. So we use that to calculate then the total amount of food that was wasted over those seven days, in that case, 2.8 tons. Then, <coughs> I don't know where, yeah. Then we multiply by the cost of one kilo of food. Surprisingly, many, many uh, professionals do not know 
what is the weighted average cost of one kilo of food purchase. I won't go too much into details, but the idea is to have an idea. If you take all the different type of ingredients that you are actually purchasing, they each have a different price per kilo, right? Of course, the seafood would be much higher than fruits, for instance. So the idea is to do a weighted average. Here we're taking, for the sake of the example, $3 per one kilo of food will give you a total. The total will be over seven days, that's $8,517 that were wasted. On top of that, you remember the hidden cost? We add 15%, which is labor and utility, usually much higher. If you take Singapore, that's more closer to, uh, to 35 to 40%. And then we do the total, which we divide, I don't know where to point guys for the slide. Uh, the total, per day is 1,399, then you extend it per week and per year. This is actual first-hand data, no tweak, no, no change, no, uh, no nothing. Uh, a typical uh, all-day dining of a mid-scale hotel is half a million dollar a year. This, most of the owners, of course, they don't know. Most of the operators, they don't want to know. And that's a challenge, what was pointed out earlier. The, the, the difficulty of dealing between management and owners and the pushback we've been facing was this, is those figures are too big to handle. And to bring that to your owners and say, well, it seems that we have an issue, um, many, many people don't want to do that. So that's also why it's kind of, you know, hidden under the carpet, and we are here to help the industry to <laughs> accept that there is an issue and then work on it because there is big money to, uh, to, uh, to save. So that brings me to my, to my point. How do you calculate savings? And it's not that super straightforward, unfortunately, and it's still work in progress, and we're having like surreal conversations with director of finance of very large groups, where we even challenging what is the financial indicator that is unchallengeable to calculate the savings related to food waste reduction. And it's funny because it is still not there. What we decided to do, well, you're all familiar with the food cost percentage, basically purchasing divided by sales. We decided that it isn't complete and it's not reflective of how performant you are as a restaurant. If you buy low enough, or if you sell high enough, you have a good food cost percentage, doesn't mean that you are, doing, you are optimizing the use of food as a resource. So we decided to go for one extra type of indicator, which is the cost per cover. And cost per cover, which is interesting because we realize that the industry is not super specific on tracking the number of covers. And that's, that's a, a first realization which was interesting. So without going too much uh, uh, in depth, cost per cover is everything you bought divided by the number of people that have been eating. So we track this example. If your cost per cover this month is 297, your baseline was 320. That means that you're saving 23 cents per cover. Then you multiply by the number of covers. This is an example of an uh, all-day dining year, uh, monthly uh, uh, covers. That will give you the savings related to food waste prevention. That's one of the indicators. So the cost per cover, what we're currently trying to do is to influence the way the hotels are reporting on their financial performance on food and beverage and particularly here in food, because we exclude all the data on beverage, to see if they are performing or not. What is important to look at? Um, the baseline. And this is, uh, again, for you, if you are into the profitability of your operation, the baseline is so important, because if you decide that you take one month's baseline, it may not be reflective. A baseline is a comparison, right? The, uh, your starting point before. So how do you say, for instance, I'm saving, I'm saving money? When you say I'm saving money on my supply, what period of time do you take to compare with the now? So this baseline period is actually quite challenging, especially as you know, we went through COVID. Uh, then there were some hotels that opened and closed and some that delayed, like mainland China, etc. So the baseline is super challenging. Then there is the context. So for instance, the work we're doing with, with Stefan and the team at the time was uh, your operation is unique. So uh, for instance, the, you used to have three times a day the buffet, but now it's only once a day. Uh, we have boxes that are actually sent to the, uh, to the room. So this is also something to track. And actually it's, it's quite complex, but the context is important. 
in, in being able to read financial uh, uh, indicators. Then, of course, is to track how are the ups and downs uh, in order to pinpoint precisely what sort of savings you are experiencing or why is your cost per cover going above the actual starting point. And then our interest is also to bring new indicators to the, uh, to the industry. So even the cost per cover, surprisingly, uh, uh, is relatively new and not something that is, that is commonly tracked. And here I'm, I'm talking in particular in hotels. The second, uh, the second one is the one I touched on very quickly, the weighted average cost of one kilo of food, which is usually not that uh, uh, specifically calculated. Then the inflation, as I touched on at the beginning, if you use, for instance, six months baseline, um, September, well, uh, uh, August till December last year, this is your reference point, and then you started in Jan to compare your performance. Well, the inflation last year has to be factored in. That means that you cannot compare the cost per cover of that reference period to now because in the meantime, you've been paying your, your food uh, more than what you used to. So that has also to be taken into consideration. And then kilo per cover. And that was one of my questions at the beginning. I was, you know, <laughs> I was naive and, 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 and probably a bit stupid, but I was, I was asking Chef, how many kilos of food are you buying per month? If you know how many people are normally eating in this standard month, how many kilos are you actually buying? And that's where I realized that those metrics are not being tracked. The volume in kilos of food purchase, even though if you are you know, organizing an event for your friends, you, know, you have 10 friends coming, you will know quite precisely what sort of volume you will be looking at. In the industry, very often, what is being tracked is just dollar in, dollar out. Not the volume, and even, not even very precisely the covers, the number of people eating. So that's where we're saying there is a huge gap between the type of indicators being used and what we should be looking at if we really want to look at performance of the, uh, the, the restaurant operation. So to me, this one is a very interesting one. Uh, for those of you that are really into the industry, the reason why we started to look at that is we were working with a very large hotel in Bangkok. We're covering eight of their what we call recording points. This hotel was wait wasting approximately 1.2 tons per day. We started to measure, reduce, implement new procedures, and they were down around 900 kilos. We were tracking their financial indicators, the classic one, typically the food cost percentage, and it was flat. So the management was saying, hey, we're not saving anything. Food cost percentage show us is exactly the same. And we're like, but guys, there is 300 kilos less each day that is not going to the bin. So that must translate in, in dollar figure, right? But we couldn't see it. So then we started to ask new questions. Can we start reporting on covers? Can we start tracking? the volume of food purchase in kilos. And once we did that, we realized that actually they were investing the savings into better quality product, which is completely fine. But if you don't track those additional indicator, you don't see it. The savings whew, are vanishing. So it was in a way an interesting, you know, aha moment to, th to see that Bringing new indicators will bring also more transparency and more granularity in the way you run your operation and how financially sustainable you are. And that was, that was to me, uh, a couple of realizations. And including this, I don't know what's your opinion, but I think that it makes total sense to track also the volume of food that I purchased, not only in dollar figure, but in volume. And we have seen just on that point some huge discrepancies, five star, hotel in the Maldives who would get uh, supply only twice a week or once a week, they would purchase <laughs> up to 3.2 kilo of raw food per cover. 3.2 kilo, when you know that an average person would eat four to 500 grams of end product, so maybe one kilo of, of, of raw product. Whereas you compare it to an older dining in the city center of Bangkok, for instance, they would purchase 1.6 to 1.8 kilo per cover. 
Anyway, that's a lot of figures, but just, just for you to give you an idea of not looking at those metrics, you follow basically not the wrong indicators, but incomplete financial indicators that are not necessarily telling you the whole story. And that's where we are, we are trying to, uh, to influence the industry. And this is an example, very boring, it looks like Bloomberg, sorry about that, but basically this, which is tracking your baseline period and the way your cost per cover has been evolving and the same way with the food cost percentage. And as you can see, it's interesting to notice, again for those in finance, that the food cost percentage could go up while your cost per cover can go down. And that opens a lot of questions, which I hope we can discuss uh, also together. I will skip that one because Stefan, no, yeah, Stefan brilliantly uh, presented us, and that was, oh, you Stefan, uh, the beginning of our Hyatt story, because by going in depth, implementing change, monitoring food waste, reviewing procedures, having them verified by third party, then it starts to pay off. And in that case, uh, uh, we save around $100,000 in 10 months uh, uh, to, the, to the hotel, which was uh, nicely shared, and that opened the door to the, uh, to the corporate office. 10% for you, uh, Stefan. Um, and then this is another example. You, some of you were asking, okay, is it only applicable to large hotels? Because of course, not everyone is uh, the Grand Hyatt uh, or this sort of, of large volume. We also work with much smaller operation, salad bars, for instance, in Singapore, salad stop, if you're familiar with it, or um, high-end restaurants uh, like uh, Michelin Star uh, uh, in Bangkok, where of course the volume is not massive. But what is interesting is that bringing down to the number of covers they do per day, around 35 to 50, well, it pays off also very, very quickly. So, and this is another example of a cluster Hyatt. So that was the step after the Grand Hyatt in, uh, uh, in um, Singapore. Then we had those eight Hyatts around five countries. And, um, and yeah, and that opened the door for, for the whole uh, Hyatt network. And again, hope it's just, uh, just the beginning. So sorry, I hope it was not too boring, too technical, too data driven, but I mean, what I learned from my career in sustainability is there are a lot of great intentions. There are a lot of people passionate. The issue is that they cannot be taken seriously if A, they're not technical enough and B, they don't talk money. And that's why I'm bringing that topic here today to that audience, to you guys. It is no bulletproof. It is not like, you know, the, the uh, uh, unquestionable uh, uh, truth. Um, it is years and years of practice, of reflection, of testing, of failing, then testing a different angle and, and you know, trying to, to identify how do we put an exact indicator to show the savings related to food waste so that it, is, it cannot be challenged. And it's, uh, again, ongoing process, but I really believe that if we take a financial approach to sustainability in general, and I know that for some of the... Um, the uh, stuff, for instance, presented earlier, it's more challenging. That's also why we decided to go into the food waste area, because to me it was obvious from, from day one. You can see that bin still full of food. I'm like, guys, how many bins you have like that every day? Every single day? That must be a lot of money. And that's why we do what we do today. And uh, yeah, I hope it was uh, somehow uh, insightful, and, and I hope you have some, uh, some question for, for me. Thank you, Ben. There's tons of questions there. I'd like to, as usual, start with my own question. Yeah. <laughs> you, you stumbled across a ton of data. Yeah. Um, and in the process of stumbling across that data, maybe you might have something that is useful for chefs. Like, are there any small little interventions that chefs and restaurateurs can do to their own business? Oh, yeah. It doesn't require a lot, no. but could potentially result in, in big change. Oh, for sure. No, no, for sure. I mean, I'm, I'm, um, the solutions I've presented were, were uh, as I mentioned, now predominantly uh, implemented in, in larger operation. But, but I see some, some restaurants that are thriving without any specific, you know, advanced technology. That's why I was referring to uh, uh, leadership and vision essential, then training of the staff. We spend a lot of time working with the staff in the kitchen in their own language so that they understand why. 
and to meet all boys down to the why. If your team do not understand why suddenly you ask them to look at food waste from social, environmental, and financial perspective, they won't do it. So if you have leadership plus awareness raising and then very simple food waste monitoring system, which can be done even on, on pen and paper, you can see some dramatic results. And then the rest is fine tuning. Thank you. That's why I was referring to uh, uh, leadership and vision, essential. Then training of the staff. We spend a lot of time working with the staff in the kitchen in their own language so that they understand why. And to me, it all boils down to the why. If your team do not understand why suddenly you ask them to look at food waste from social, environmental, and financial perspective, they won't do it. So if you have leadership plus awareness raising and then very simple food waste monitoring system, which can be done even on, on pen and paper, happen with the, with the Hyatt is pretty remarkable because since they saw what can happen uh, by tackling food waste, they imposed to the entire Asia Pacific network to have food waste monitoring system in place. Mm which is how the industry is being nudged, how we kick them a bit on the sides and not this way, that way. And it's becoming now part of, of, their, of the way they operate, and which is a, a great uh, success. But to your point, the, uh, uh, the cost of sustainability or that tipping point to me is what is the cost of the status quo? Yeah, well, it's not sustainable. So. It's not sustainable. And how much does it cost you now by doing nothing, by doing your day-to-day -day routine as you normally do? Well, if you don't look in your bin, you wouldn't know. If you st start looking in your bin and then tell, tell, well, I have two kilos a day, is not worth it. Well, possibly. You have 12 kilos per day, mm, start to be something. You have 40, 50 plus, okay, uh, you know that you will recoup your time investment very quickly, even though that it should be embedded anyways. It should be, and again, no fancy technology, no crazy AI, da, da, just mindset, being mind, mindful of what you do. And I know it's easier said than done, but successful organizations have a very strong culture. They don't have people coming in and out all the time. Mm. They know exactly leadership, direction, vision, and then the people are actually doing it and feeling good for doing it. That's... I think a couple more questions. No, I've been told to stop. Yes, ma'am. Okay. <gasps> we got censored. Thank okay, you thank much. you everyone. Thank, thank you. you ben. Thank you, buddy. Good to see you again.